thanks for the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> to be talking in the uh, three lectures, uh, as you can see, about the quantum logo theorems. Um, now, when I started thinking about this, I realized there are sort of all kinds of different things that I wanted to include, and I was never going <coughs> to get all those different things in, because um, there just wouldn't be much time. And uh, it's a sort of remarkable fact, actually, that... Um, no go theorems I'm talking about, Bell's theorem, Nation Specter theorem, um, are still areas of very um, intensive research that's still going on even sort of 50 years after the original publications. Um, so, yes, lots to say, and uh, I'm not quite sure how, many, how much we'll actually get through, but we'll just see <coughs> how much we can put in. So the lectures will focus on three well-known logo theorems. Bell's theorem, which is to do with non-locality, Ocean Specker theorem and, and related theorems, which are to do with contextuality, <coughs> and the more recent result, uh, the PBR theorem, which is to do with psi ontology. <coughs> and I'll explain what that means when we get to it. So what's a no-go theorem? Well, roughly speaking, a no-go theorem states that some class of theories or models either doesn't exist, uh, in the case of Cauchy's Specker, or must make different predictions from quantum theory, which is what Bell and the PBR theorem say. And of course, experimental tests have been done and results have always been in quantum theory. Now really these things are significant for two different kinds of reasons. The first kind of reason is uh, foundational. Uh, we understand quantum theory better by knowing these things. Uh, for, for one thing, these results tell us that there is no underlying theory waiting to be discovered that is, let's say, locally causal or non-contextual or epistemic. And the other kind of reason why these results are significant is to do with simulation of quantum theory by uh, classical means. So what the no-go theorems tell us is that quantum theory cannot be simulated by a model that is locally causal or uh, non-contextual or epistemic. And uh, this can lead to quantum advantages in information processing tasks. <coughs> um, so, so here's a, a kind of summary of some things that we might cover uh, if, if there's time. Um, part one will be to do with non-locality. We'll see if we can look at all those things. Part two to do with uh, contextuality, and part three to do with psi ontology. Okay, so from locality. <coughs> so let's. Uh, I must admit, I don't quite know the sort of background of everybody in the room, so, uh, but we'll take it slow at least to begin with. Them some other things. So this is what I'm going to call the CHSH game, uh, after the version of Bell's theorem um, due to Bowser, Hall, Schumann, and Holt. So we've got two people, Alice and Bob. Uh, they are separated. Alice was given an input X, and she was required to produce an output A. Bob is given an input y, he is required to produce an output b. Now, all of x, y, a, and b here are binary, they take values 0 to 1. And Alice and Bob will win this game if their outputs satisfy the following relation. So this here is just the sum mod 2, and it says that the sum mod 2 of a and b should be equal to x times y. So they jointly win, they're not playing against they're each other. They're not playing against each other, that's yeah. right, they're cooperating. So who wins? You said you're you right, Alice, come on, both win. So both of them win. Ah. If this is true, they're cooperating. So ah. they, so but if this is not true, then neither of them win. Ah, OK, 
Okay, so just another way of writing that last thing. Equivalently, they will win in the following circumstances. If the inputs x, y were either 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, then they should output the same value, a equals b, and if the inputs x, y were both 1, then they should output different values. If you want, you can think of there being a referee in the picture as well. And it's the referee who hands to them the inputs x and y. They give a and b back to the referee. The referee verifies this relation. So they're playing against the referee in some sense. All right. Um, now, so far, there's no quantum resources in this. These are just the classical players. We could give them an extra classical resource if we want to. That's what this lambda is. That indicates that they can have shared random data. Um, so, so lambda is just uh, some random variable, and Alice knows what it is, and Bob knows what it is. Um, so the, the important thing to say is that they can get together beforehand to try and agree some kind of strategy, or perhaps roll some dice and agree on the value of lambda. Um, what they cannot do is talk to one another after they've been separated. In particular, they can't talk to one another after they've received these inputs x and y. So that's what the wall is indicating. And then it's quite easy to show, it's just a backable envelope calculation really, that their probability of winning is less than or equal to three quarters. Assuming that is that the inputs are uh, uniformly distributed, which I have assumed. Um, so I won't do that in detail. It's quite easy to see actually that shared random data isn't going to help them. Um, because all they're doing then is, is uh, mixing together different strategies. Following one strategy if lambda takes some value and a different strategy if lambda takes some other value and so on. They may as well just use whichever strategy is the best. So by that kind of argument, in fact their best strategy is just a deterministic one. So they can get together beforehand and Alice can say to Bob something like, well, if I get x equals naught, I'll output a is naught, so you better do this, and so on. Um, but there is no deterministic strategy where they succeed on more than three out of the four possible joint inputs. All right, and now we come to the same game, but with quantum players. So their players are still Alice and Bob, um, but being quantum players, they're given an extra resource. So instead of merely being able to have shared random data, they now have an entangled quantum state shared between them. So they'll have uh, two quantum particles, which are jointly, let's say, in the maximally entangled phi plus state there. And what they're going to do now is they can do measurements on their particles depending on the values of their inputs. So if x is naught, Alice does this measurement, computational basis. If x is 1, she does the x measurement. If y is naught or 1, Bob does these uh, diagonal measurements like this. <coughs> and you can show that this way, their probability of winning is cos squared of pi by 8. It's just a simple quantum calculation which is equal to 2 plus root 2 on 4, which is roughly 0.85, which is more than 3 quarters. So using quantum entanglement, they're winning this game with a greater probability than you could do if you only had access to shared random data. And it's irrelevant who measures first, I think. Hmm? It's irrelevant who... It's irrelevant who, who measures first, um, because um, according to quantum theory, predictions, that is the joint outcome probabilities, don't depend on the versions first. Um, and in the context of the game, they can't talk to one another once they've got their inputs x, y. Um, so it's not going to make any difference that way. Um, okay, now, um, Bell didn't originally present his results in terms of, you know, a sort of funny little game like this. Um, so a more sort of traditional description goes something like this. We talk about hidden variables. We imagine a pair of quantum particles produced at a source in the quantum state phi plus. 
measurements, X and Y, will be performed on those particles. And then we imagine that this phi plus is actually an incomplete description of the particles somehow, which is actually reflecting our ignorance of the values of some underlying variables, lambda. These are the hidden variables. The quantum state will be determined, will determine the probability distribution U over lambda. Probabilities for outcomes A, B are determined by lambda. And that means that the joint probability for getting outcomes A, B, given that X, Y were measured, will be written like this. And having presented things this way, Bell introduced the condition I'll call Bell locality, which is the condition that uh, once you condition on a particular value of lambda, then this thing factorizes. And furthermore, this term here doesn't depend on y, and this term here doesn't depend on x. And that makes sense. If you think that these measurements are widely separated in space, because essentially we're saying that, for example, Alice's outcome shouldn't depend on Bob's choice of measurement, and vice versa. However, if you're winning that CHSH game I was talking about, with probability more than three quarters, what that tells you precisely is that the overall correlations cannot be written in this form for any space of, of lambdas and measure mu over lambda. Okay, so there's the, the sort of more traditional way of putting it, and of course there's been some sort of argument about what this means ever since. So we can say it's as if these quantum particles are talking to each other, even though the measurements might have been space-like separated. Um, now there are models, such as the de broglie bohm theory, that define an explicit space of the hidden variables lambda, and where that Bell locality condition fails. So for example, uh, probability for outcome A may indeed depend on Bob's choice of measurement. Such models are explicitly non-local. Standard quantum theory evades the question, we obtain correct predictions, <coughs> the observed correlations, but without describing any kind of explicit mechanism that would mediate those correlations. And the other thing to say is that this effect, can, of course, cannot be used directly to signal. So here's a, a general statement of that that follows from the quantum no signaling principle, which says that if two parties share generically any kind of uh, joint state of two systems and then one measures the other one cannot determine what the first one's choice of measurement was simply by looking at their own outcomes. Um, so let's do this quickly. Here's, here's the proof of that. Row AB is a density matrix, the state of the system. Um, let's say that Alice measures her particle and her measurement is a hover measurement of some kind, so it corresponds to a set EI of positive operators, sum to the identity. If Alice gets outcome I, then Bob's collapse state is this one. On the other hand, if Bob doesn't know which outcome Alice got, then from his point of view, we can average over Alice's outcomes. So, averaging over the different collapse states for Bob, we get this, which is this, which is this, which is in fact just Bob's marginal state row B from the original joint state row AB means is that if Bob performs a measurement and is ignorant of Alice's outcome, then his outcome probabilities are independent of which measurement Alice chose to do. So she can't signal to Bob simply by varying her choice of which measurement to do. I showed you how using some pair of entangled quantum systems, Alice and Bob could win that game with a certain probability. It was roughly 0.85. And the significant thing was that it was more than three quarters. We might ask, can Alice and Bob do any better than that using quantum systems? Can they win with probability 1, <coughs> for example? And the answer is well known. Um, no. Cyrilson showed... Um, 
Yes, in 1980 in, in this paper. But actually, for any shared state at all of any dimension, and whichever measurements the inputs x01 and y01 might correspond to, Alice and Bob's probability of winning is always less than or equal to this, <coughs> which is what they obtained previously. Um, let's not dwell on this, but let's have a quick look at the proof. Um, it turns out it's easier to sort of change variables slightly so that we're talking so that outcomes are associated with values 1 and minus 1 rather than 0 to 1. So suppose Alice's measurement is like this, px for a projector, i minus px for the other outcome. Here's Bob's measurement, qy, and i minus qy for the other outcome. And of course x and y take values 0 to 1. Define operators a0, a1, b0, b1. Where for example, a0 is 2 times the projector p0 minus the identity. So each of those has eigenvalues 1 and minus 1. And consider this quantity here. So this is an operator, um, which is this sum of products of the A's and B's. And now it's simple to see that um, probability of winning that game will be the expectation value of this operator under the state row AB, which is the shared thing they have, uh, divided by A plus a half. And now a quick little thing can show that uh, g squared is equal to this, and there it's written in terms of commutators in A and B. And this here is the standard operator norm. So the operator norm of that commutator is less than or equal to 2 times norm of A0 times norm of A1, which is 2, hence expectation value of g is less than or equal to 2 root 2. And you'll get the p of win is less than or equal to that, which is what we said. Alright, so very uh, general proof here. We didn't need to assume anything about the shared state or about dimensions or measurement choices or anything. Just in quantum theory, you cannot do better than that. Alright, um, now I went fairly quickly over all of that because it's uh, quite old stuff. Now we start to come to more recent lines of research. Quantum theory, we can only win with this probability. Now, Popescu and Rorlick wondered, why can't we do better than that? Could it be, for example, that if you win the game with greater probability, then somehow, inevitably, you will violate the no-signaling principle? That would be a powerful result, because the no signaling principle is supported by another theory, special relativity. Um, and so if you could see that you would violate that by winning the game with greater probability, that would be a, a very nice and sort of coherent explanation of why you can't do better than that. But they found, however, that the answer to that question is no. In other words, it's possible at least to imagine a fictional device which respects the no-signaling principle. So if Alice and Bob have this thing, they wouldn't be able to send messages using it directly. But where the device would allow Alice and Bob to win this game with certainty. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, you proved that, that Alice and Bob can't win the probability of very thin sequence with the other four. And then the premise for the argument in the next bullet point is that <coughs> supposing that they could win with more. Right, yeah, so my misunderstanding, but it seems to me that's a doubt thing to say. Right. Right. If, if you've already proved that they can't, then you assume that they can, and what's happening? But, but what, where's my misunderstanding? Um, fair, fair point. Um, we proved that the proof was showing that they can't win in quantum theory using quantum systems with probability greater than around 1 to 5. Um, what we're doing here is we're imagining, suppose they have some systems that just aren't described by quantum theory. Um, that could enable them to win the probability greater than that. That's the bound result. Would we inevitably violate the, the, yeah, the no signaling principle? Um, and as I was 
were saying, well, the, the answer was no, you can imagine this fictional device fictional because we think everything is disliked by quantum theory and this device would not be. But we're considering it nonetheless. So, what the device actually is simple to write down. Um, it's, it's become known as a PR box in the literature. Um, there are many, many papers just sort of playing around with these things now. So, PR after Popescu and Rolick. And PR box, we could, it's box as in black box. We're supposed to think of this system as a kind of black box. So, you don't really know what's in there um, or what theory describes its behavior. What you can do is you can introduce inputs into it, and then it produces outputs for you. And the box itself is simply defined by conditional probability distributions, the, the probabilities of getting the different outputs for the different uh, input choices. So we're going to define it this way. Um, P of AB given XY is given by... Um, these things, so, I mean, it, you'll see it's exactly what we need, in fact, to win the game with probability 1. If we introduce inputs x, y equal to 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0 into this thing, then with certainty the outputs will be correlated, they'll have the same value, and with probability a half they'll both be 0, and with probability a half they'll both be 1. On the other hand, if you input x equals 1 here and y equals 1 here, then with certainty the outputs will be anti-correlated. And again, there's a half chance each of getting the two possibilities, 0, 1, and 1, 0. So it's simply defined in such a way that the outputs always satisfy this equation. But it is non-signaling because if Alice, say, looks at her marginal probabilities for A being this or that, it's always 1 half, no matter what Bob does. And vice versa. Okay, and the, so these stronger than quantum correlations are logically possible. And actually it would be extremely useful, um, not just for that little game that I described, but for all kinds of related problems that are generically are known as communication complexity problems, where separated parties want to calculate some function of joint inputs without needing to communicate too much. And the question we're sort of asking now then, is why doesn't nature allow these things? So this is the question that Pesco and Rorik asked. Um, it's not obviously a good question. We have a simple answer as well. Because nature is described by quantum theory. And given quantum theory, you can show using simple maths that you cannot produce these correlations, and that might be it. Um, but, but as it happens, Asking this question has turned up just a lot of very interesting uh, sort of answers of, of different kinds and has proved to be quite a fruitful thing to do and, and there are lots of papers doing this. Um, so I'm going to show you just uh, one thing, um, a sort of physical principle that if you accept it would rule out these things. This was some work by um, Pavlovsky and others. It was published in Nature, in fact. And we're going to consider another of these sort of little games, um, a little bit similar to the one before, um, but with some difference. So again, we have Alice and Bob separated. And once they're separated, um, this time their communication is limited, <coughs> rather than being zero, I'll come to that. Um, we can think again, if we want, of there being a referee in the picture, if that helps. And so, um, Alice has given an input x, which is an n-bit string this time, rather than just being a single bit. Now, Alice is allowed to communicate something to Bob, she communicates z 
Well, she chooses Z, and Z is a K bit string. Bob is given an input Y, where Y simply takes on the values 1 to N. And Bob is required to output a single bit B. And the aim here, the thing that Alice and Bob are trying to satisfy, is that if this input Y takes a certain value, let's say I, then Bob wants his output bit B to be equal to the ith bit of Alice's input string. <coughs> so you can think of it this way, Alice is holding this data and Bob wants to know <coughs> something about that data. It's a fairly generic kind of problem, really. Um, he doesn't necessarily want to know all of that data, he just wants a certain piece of it. And the difficulty is that Alice is limited in how much she can send to him. She can only send this k-bit string, where k is less than n, otherwise she'd just send him the whole thing. And also, Bob doesn't know in advance which little piece of that data he's going to want. That's what Y tells him. So again, we can think about classical players playing this game. So we can give them access to shared random data. That's what the lambda is up there again. We can also think about quantum players playing the game. These ones will have pre-shared entanglement. Um, so not necessarily just one entangled pair of particles, but as many entangled pairs as they want. And so there are many pairs, each of them in the state phi plus. And in the quantum version of this game, a generic protocol will go something as follows. First of all, Alice receives the value x from the referee, where x is drawn randomly from the set of all input strings. Um, depending on x, Alice will perform a measurement on her quantum systems over here. But then Alice sends Z to Bob, where Z depends on X and on the outcome of Alice's measurement. Bob will then measure his quantum systems, and his choice of measurement there can depend on his input Y, also on the communication Z that he received. And finally, Bob will output bit B, where of course B can depend on, on Z that he received, also on his input Y, also on the outcome. Okay. And we might ask how successful is a given protocol? Well, you could just look at the probability of winning, which is the thing that we looked at before. Um, this time we're going to consider a different quantity. Um, we want to quantify the amount of information on average that B contains about the bit Xi. And so we're going to sit up, consider the following quantity. So this is a sum here of this term, where this is the mutual information between the bit Xi and the bit B, conditioned on the case the input Y was I. <coughs> As I said, I'm slightly unsure of the background of the talking to. Let me say a quick word about mutual information just in case it's helpful. Um, so first of all, if we're given random variable x and entropy, um, given by this expression, and the p's are the probabilities for x to take different values. Okay. Um, <coughs> All those p's are not all one, so that x has a definite value, then 
equals zero. Entropy takes its maximum value <coughs> when uh, the distribution is uniform. Assume a discrete random variable, in which case, given a uniform distribution, the entropy is log 2 of d, where d is the number of different values it has. And given two variables, x and y, the mutual information is h of x plus h of y minus the joint entropy over x, y. And this thing quantifies the correlations between x, y. So it tells us something like this. If I learn <coughs> x, how much does that tell me about the value of y? So in particular, if x and y are completely uncorrelated, that means their joint distribution is a product distribution, then this mutual information is zero, because x is not telling you anything about y. <coughs> All right, so this is the quantity that we're looking at here between these two bits. And to have it conditioned on y being i just means you condition all the probabilities in that expression on y being i. And Pavlovsky and others introduced this principle which they called information causality. Information causality is the principle that if we look at that thing, it's less than or equal to k, but remember, k is the number of bits that Alice is sending to Bob during the course of the protocol. Um, so roughly speaking, it's saying something like this. It's saying that no matter what pre-shared resources they might have, entanglement for the quantum people, shared random data for the classical people, if Alice communicates k bit to Bob, k bits to Bob, but then the total information access that Bob gains to her data is no more than k. Now if k is zero, then Alice isn't sending anything to Bob. And this principle, information causality, simply reduces to the no-signaling principle. In that case, Bob shouldn't be able to learn anything about the data Alice has. So we could think of this principle then as a sort of more refined notion of the no-signaling principle. Um, that includes the no-signaling principle itself, that's the zero communication case, but then also takes into account the possibility of a finite amount of communication from Alice to Bob. Now, here's a theorem, and this is what Pavlovsky and the others show. A theorem says that any classical or quantum protocol here satisfies information causality. <coughs> Actually, they don't only satisfy it. Even classical players can saturate the information causality bound up there. So it's easy to see how to do that. Simply, let Alice's communication Z be equal to the first k bits of x, let's say. Now, in that case, they get lucky if Bob's input y is a, one of the values 1 to k, because then he knows exactly what the corresponding bit of x was and can simply output that value. <coughs> Otherwise, he just simply has to guess. And using that protocol, they'll saturate that value. Okay, so classical and quantum players um, satisfy that thing. I'm not going to present the proof of that. Um, it's in the paper I cited. It's basically a series of manipulations, fairly standard manipulations of uh, entropies and mutual informations. What we can consider is what if the players have those PR boxes I was talking about, the friction of things, which are more non-local than you can get in quantum theory. And actually it's quite easy to see that if they have PR boxes, then they can violate this thing. Um, and, and not just violate, but violate it to the sort of uh, maximum possible. Um, the left-hand side evaluates to the algebraic limit of the expression, um, which will be n. So 
here's how they do that. Consider the following protocol. Suppose that Alice and Bob share n of these PR boxes between them. Alice is simply going to input the bits x1 to xn into her bits of the NPR boxes. And after she's done that, she'll obtain outputs from those boxes, call them a1 to an. <coughs> then she evaluates the sum mod 2 of all of those a's, call that z. So actually z's just a single bit here. She doesn't even need for z to be k bits. One bit will do. And she sends z to Bob. Now, if Bob's input y takes the value i, he'll just input 0 into all his PR boxes, except for the i which he'll put input 1. From those boxes, he'll obtain outputs, call them c1 to cn. And then he evaluates the sum mod 2 of all those c's and also adds on the value of z, which Alice sent him. And from this and the rules governing the behavior of PR boxes, it's easy to check that Bob's output b will always be equal to this is bit xi. Hence, if you work this thing out, you get n. <coughs> okay, so, so far, what have we seen? I mean, we've just seen another game, really, where um, quantum players can play it with a certain degree of success, and certain classical ones, and if you have these magic PR boxes, then you can do it better. Um, so, so what, really? Well, here's actually the, the, the interesting bit that was uh, those guys' reason for introducing this. We can also consider what if the players have noisy PR boxes. So a noisy PR box is just defined again by a set of conditional probability distributions. And to make sure it's still non-signaling, we'll just have all the uh, marginals for Alice and Bob's local outputs to be a half. And let's say that the probability that the outputs satisfy this relation, the one that um, defines the PR box, is given by some number Q, where Q is between a half and one. So if Q is one, that's the perfect PR box. Otherwise, it's a noisy one. And this thing is super quantum if and only if Q is more than this. The theorem that they show is that with these uh, noisy PR boxes, information causality can be violated if and only if the boxes are super quantum. So it's, it's not uh, merely that the perfect PR box enables you to do better than the quantum players. What we've recovered is uh, a nicer result than that. <coughs> because this principle of information causality picks out the quantum bound Exactly. It shows that if you can only do what the quantum players can do, you always satisfy this thing. And as soon as you can be better than that, as soon as you're more non-local, even by a tiny, tiny bit, then you violate this reasonably natural looking uh, principle. There's been quite a bit of work, uh, by the way, just by uh, different people and other groups. Um, Kind of with the same idea in mind, just trying to find natural uh, principles, physical principles, information theoretic principles that uh, serve to pick out the, the quantum correlations that you can get, the quantum degree of non-locality, and which would also serve to rule out non-quantum things. <coughs> Does that mean that uh, this result holds specifically for correlations that are heading down kind of along one line, straight from a PR box, rather than about arbitrary <coughs> correlations? Um, yes, very good question. So, if you think about a sort of arbitrary box, which is non-signaling, with binary inputs and outputs, you sort of plot the set of such boxes well, we'll sort of come to some things actually. And there's this sort of set of achievable quantum correlations that looks something like that. And there's this PR box thing which is up here. And there's local correlations which are down here. 
Um, so what this principle doesn't do, and what really no one has succeeded in doing, is, is kind of picking out exactly um, the quantum curve there. Um, so the way I define noisy PR box, I was actually defining a set of boxes along this line, um, where if that Q value was more than a certain amount that you were up here, and it was more than, uh, I think, a half in the middle, sort of out of the classical region, and so on. Um, I've accepted that the result isn't completely limited to the things on this line. It's given something not on this line, you can always sort of do a kind of randomizing operation called twirling. So you sort of process it in that way and it gets taken to that line. So what one can say is that any box that violates the Cyrilson bound would violate information causality. That statement is not sufficient to pick out this curve exactly. <coughs> that, you do look a little puzzled. Why? Well, I, I don't see how the last statement follows. So what's the difference in characterizing? So by saying precisely those that violate... Well, the let's, let's see. The Cyrilson bound is just a, uh, a linear thing. So I, on my picture, I guess it corresponds to something. Oh, okay. Um, oh, twirling moves kind of sideways. Yeah, twirling would take you, you know, from here to, to here. Right. So. But you still have these little wedges. Yeah. So. The, the <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the, 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 these guys here would not necessarily violate information. seen a multi-partite version of that exactly. Um, there have been sort of other efforts at deriving a principle yeah. which are multi-partite ones. Um, so you know, it would have been nice to include stuff about lots of these but I don't have time really. Um, but yeah there were some guys, um, Ace and others from Barcelona who came up with something uh, so that was a of no, local formality they called it. Um, yeah, which sort of does applies in multi-partite scenarios, three and higher, and, and again does a similar kind of jobs, does some work towards excluding the super quantum regime, <coughs> but again fails to characterize the quantum regime exactly. Mm. So we've seen that quantum systems can produce non-local. Um, we've also seen that logically one can imagine correlations that are more non-local than is possible in quantum theory, yet which still do respect the no-signaling principle. And finally we've seen with, that with correlations that are even a little bit more non-local than quantum information causality is violated. <coughs> So I'd like now, we're still on the topic of non-locality, but I'd like to turn to some different problems. Um, so we're going to carry on with some of this in the next lecture, I think. For today, we're well, just going to you know, start talking through it and see how far we get. Um, the first is, can we characterize completely the problem of distinguishing local and non-local correlations? And out yes, there's a nice sort of formalism there. And the second thing is can we generalize the Bell scenario that we have been considering? Um, and the answer is just yes, and I'll tell you a bit about some uh, pretty recent work actually, just the last year or two, that's been doing just that. So, characterizing non-local correlations. Here is the basic setup, the bipartite setup anyway, um, inputs x, y, outputs a, b. Now this time we won't assume that these variables are binary. Um, so let's have x taking values 0 to k minus 1, 
y naught to k minus 1, a b naught to d minus 1. Uh, we could even be slightly more general, I suppose, and have, for example, x and y have different numbers of possible values, but it wouldn't change anything in an interesting way. Um, so generically, a set of correlations is just a set of conditional probabilities, a joint output probability for AB given each possible value of XY. We could write all of those in a big vector. There's the big vector, let's call it V. And the generic sort of problem here is given such a vector V, how do we tell if these correlations are local or non-local? And another question you might ask is, given V, how do we tell if they could be produced by measuring a bipartite quantum state? So first of all, a few observations. Um, v itself lives in a real vector space, which is k squared, v squared dimensional. However, this V does satisfy a number of things. Um, the probabilities are normalized, so for each particular value of x, y, the alpha probability is sum to 1. There's also these no signaling equalities, so we'll assume that V is describes non signaling correlations. And what that means is that these things are satisfied. Um, <coughs> Alice is marginal, independent of Bob's choice, and vice versa. So taking those equalities into account, the allowed V that we can actually have actually span an affine subspace of that k squared, d squared dimensional vector space. If you take into account the number of independent equalities there, those and the normalization conditions are not all independent, so you have to think about it. You actually get that the uh, dimension of that affine subspace is this thing, and of course V also satisfies simple set of inequalities that just correspond to probabilities being greater than or equal to zero. So what this means is that the set of all possible non-signaling correlation vectors V is defined by some finite number of non-strict inequalities. Normalization ensures that it is bounded, hence the set we're talking about is a polytope, that is a convex hull of a finite number of extremal points. Let's call that polytope curly P. Now, remember this. This is going back uh, to near the beginning. The set of correlations is local if they can be written in this form. Otherwise, the correlations are non-local. Here's a, an easy theorem which we'll skip over the proof of. A set of correlations is local if and only if those conditional probabilities can be written as a convex combination of deterministic correlations. In other words, they can be written in this form where these d values are all either 0 or 1. But if you think about the set of all V that describe local correlations, let's call that set curly L, well that set is also a polytope. It's just the convex hull of all the deterministic correlations, that is those V that satisfy this thing. And given a polytope, the facets of that polytope correspond to linear inequalities. They correspond to inequalities that have this sort of a form. And these are the Bell inequalities. So quite generally now this is what we mean by the Bell inequalities. And a set of correlations is non-local then if and only if that vector V violates a Bell inequality. Because if it violates a Bell inequality it does not lie within a local polytope lies outside one of its faces. The 
correlations are quantum if they can be written like this with row density operator and uh, <coughs> the EAX and the EBY being elements of problems. So in other words, if you can get those correlations by doing measurements on a quantum state. So we can also consider the set of these V that describe quantum correlations. We'll call that one curly Q. And it is known that curly Q is convex. And is also, in this case, though, not positive. So the big picture looks something like this. So we've got the smaller polytope. That's the set of local correlations. We've got the bigger polytope, P, that's a set of all non-signaling local and non-local correlations. And in between those two, we've got this set, this convex set, curly Q, which is the set you can get in quantum theory. And what we've seen already, we all know that it, uh, we know already that these inclusions are proper. So there are quantum correlations that are not local. That's what we began with. And also there are non-signaling correlations not quantum PR boxes, an example of that. <coughs> okay, so just a reminder of what we were doing. Given this vector V, how do we tell if the correlations are local or non local? And how do we tell if they can be produced by measuring quantum states? This just reduces to the problem of determining whether this vector V is contained in the local polytope or whether it's contained in Q, the quantum set. But determining membership of a vector in a polytope with specified vertices is a linear programming problem. Um, so linear programming problems are usually thought of as efficient or easy in some sense, except NV. In this case, the number of vertices that our polytope has increases exponentially, for example, with the number of settings available to Alice and Bob. So there's a certain sense in which as we generate the scenario, it gets exponentially more difficult. Determining membership in the set Q, this is the sort of generalized Cyrilson problem, seems harder and is not solved in general. thing that I would like to talk about is uh, some ways of generalizing the, the basic sort of bipartite uh, in our scenario that we've been talking about. Um, but why don't we, that would be a good place to start next time and it's sort of nearly time to finish so I'm going to stop there for now. So it's probably no. <laughs> and if I try, it might be wrong. I mean, I, I'm sure you're not. Um, de well, you're not dealing with the polytope anymore. Um, let's see. No, sorry, I don't have anything more insightful to say. Uh, is there a known set of correlations which is known not to be quantum, but also known? So the shaded region here, we know how to do it. We know to be right? me to prove it or write them up on it. That's the paper somewhere. Um, 
I, I, I believe so. Um, there were some papers by um, some of the people in the Bristol group, for example. I don't have to see if I can dig it up, I think. Um, Could you get one just by starting in one of these spaces and adding some noise? Say starting at the corner. Which face? Uh, the shaded, what the shaded region is pointing at. So say starting at that corner, for instance. Yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so starting there. Noisy fi. Noisy fi. Can you go inside the region? If you add random oh, noise oh, to I this, see. you're just moving to the center. So we'll be in here. Um, actually, there, there is a kind of an incidental result in my thesis which um, works for this straight line, the other straight line in the other shaded region. The one on the left shows that all of those models violate information compatibility. Um, so, so which <coughs> the, the straight line on this um, the shaded region on, on the left? This line? Yes. So those models correspond to introducing noise on just one uh, joint measurement setting. And uh, yeah, I can show that by the same protocol in the original Tavlovsky paper that those violate information causalities. I see. So you're saying that some of these do violate it just using the same protocol. Yeah. Uh, not only these ones, which I've already said, but I it. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, if you, in general, I guess it'll be a tricky problem establishing exactly which violate it and which don't. Because you have to somehow think about this, you know, all possible protocols that you might do with the thing. To show that it doesn't. It makes information causality kind of difficult to deal with, I suppose. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm done. Okay, you just done. I'm not sure I understood the status of the shape of the quantum region. So you said <coughs> you seem to indicate that its shape was known, but then you also said it's not known how to determine whether you are inside it. So that let me um, Let's have a look. So it's defined simply by this. Right. Uh, so that means we do know its shape. Well, in the sense that it's defined. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you mean we don't have an algorithm that we can use to inside to So something like that. I mean, we, we have a large number of inequalities, which are, you can think of as generalized Cyrilson type inequalities. Um, and, you know, if you violate one of those, you know that you're not in the region Q. Um, but it's, it's not like the local case where, you know, the finite set of inequalities that are completely uh, sufficient. Is it settled for Bell scenarios? Can you decide if you're in Q for a Bell scenario? You said it's not known in general. Yeah, I, I, I think um, when I said no algorithm, I, I didn't mean to suggest it was an undecided problem or something like that. Um, so I, I meant something sort of. As, as long as you as you as you say what well, the dimension of field space would be, then it's decided to know. Yeah, right. So then it's probably a sort of um, semi-definite programming problem or something. Um, I mean, the the trickier issue is is that. The way I define the region Q, we weren't supposed to be limiting the dimension. <laughs> That's 
something about these uh, uh, semi uh hierarchy of the Vasquez and Piro. Right, so that's also, a th yeah, actually a good comment. Um, so what there is is sort of is a hierarchy of sets. Each of one is characterized by a semi-definite programming problem. And so you can um, decide quite efficient membership of each of those sets. And they converge on the quantum set. So they um, they're larger than the quantum set. So if you have any one of those sets, it's enough to call something not in the quantum set. Yeah. So <laughs> call, call them, there's, there's the actual quantum set in the middle, and then we have the, they call them Q1, Q2, and they go in like this. That one's Q. And so testing membership in, of one of these is, as I said, a semi-definite programming problem. So that's good because it gives you witnesses both ways, right? If something is in the set Q, you already have a short proof of it because you just have to give yeah. the operators E as well. Yeah. And if not in, you would also have a short proof because there's uh, some end. Some yeah, you say short. I mean, potentially depending on how far down this hierarchy you would have a short yeah. witness. Because the witness could be the end. <coughs> you know, you have, a, have a, a witness, right? Even if the algorithm is fine, the witness may not be short. The witnesses. Oh, the I 17. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. That's why I think this is a witness that you're about to point out. That, that can be okay. Okay. Does the complexity increase within the Q1? Uh, yes. Exponentially or something. Uh, oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> that would characterize quantum correlations. Would it not be good enough to have some non-physically motivated characterization? Uh, in a sense, we already have a characterization, of course, which is quantum theory. Yes. You know, so as I said, it's not obviously a good question to begin with. So what would you mean by a non-physically motivated? No, I mean, you know, I could present a sort of mathematical reformulation of quantum theory and then say there it is and that picks out the quantum set. Yes. So I, I mean, well, so I, I, I want to kind of ask you the, the other way. I mean, what makes you think that there should be a, a physically motivated principle that characterizes quantum I think, I mean, should be is a bit too strong, you see. But I think you just asked the question, and then it's turned out, um, it's led to quite a few interesting results. Yeah. So with hindsight, I think we can say it was a good question. Um, but apart from that, I, you know, I don't see why there'd be a strong reason to say what well, should be, as in there must be some principle yes. that characterizes the concept. If we did have a 
of such a thing. It looks like that's exactly what we could do with quantum theory. It can be very useful for to know. I mean, it's a smaller part of a much wider sort of idea, a much wider program, really, I suppose, which um, goes something like this. Um, quantum theory we understand perfectly well as a mathematical formalism. And in standard textbooks, you know, that's what you'll read. You'll, you'll introduce the formalism. Um, Nonetheless, there's a feeling that something's missing from our understanding of the theory. Um, one is, for example, left with a feeling of why that formalism, why not something else, the complex Hilbert spaces and so on. Um, and there's a sort of idea that our understanding might be improved if either the whole formalism or at least some aspects of it can be seen as consequences of simple physical or information theoretic principles. So one might draw you know, something of an analogy with, uh, with Einstein and special relativity. They had much of the formalism of that already in 1905. Uh, the Lorentz transformations were written down, for example, and ideas about uh, length contraction and so forth were there. Yes. Um, but uh, Einstein made a great step forward by deriving the whole thing from his two principles. But then, um, I mean, so people like Harvey Brown have written about how um, this physical principle, this um, nothing travels faster than light or whatever, um, is a, was a nice uh, crutch and it really helped um, the theory to move forward, but somehow it's kind of kicked away in the end when you come down to general relativity. Um. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to describe uh, general relativity, you're not going to, you're not going to begin by saying, um, well, I postulate that the velocity of light is not finite. Absolutely, you are. You're going to say there's a conformal structure, which is, you know, given. <coughs> right. Which is, you know, the slightly more sophisticated way of saying. The speed of light determines the uh, quantum structure. Yes. There's an implication one way but not the other. Okay, let's go three. <laughs> <laughs>